Bim, there we go. Sorry about that, y'all. Sorry about that. What's good? What's good? What's good? What's good, party people? So, yeah, what's, what's good, y'all? So, welcome to the, the Sixers versus um, Knicks first round playoff review. And let me move this right here. Let me move something to the side here. Let me move this around and put this right here. Uh, okay. Maybe I can move it in a different place. Let me edit that. Move us around a little bit. Yeah, let me put it down. Put, let me put it down here. All right. All right. So let's do that. Bim, there we go. What's good, everybody? D blocks in the building. Cowboy Bob King Embert. What's happening? What's good? A lot wise is in the building. Snipes Entertainment. What's happening? What's good, everybody? So let's do the Sixers versus Knicks um, um, review. Right. There were some things that I looked at before um, um, or while this stuff was downloading so that we can have some visuals. Um, I was thinking about doing the off um, the regular season stats like the defense and the offense. But none of that stuff applies here because the Knicks are not the same team in April as they were in October, November. And Philadelphia is not the same team either because Joel Embiid missed a lot of time, right? Joel Embiid missed a lot of time. So instead of putting up um, numbers uh, 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 that may not apply, let's just you know what I'm saying? Talk about what we've seen. Right? Let me see here. I'm also going to... Let me put this out here for my guy also. All right. I put the link out there for, for my guy. Um, I talked to him about it earlier. Right? I, talked to, I, talked to, I think I talked to Cow, Cow, Cowboy Bob about this around 12 o'clock. And then I had some stuff come up. Oh, thank you, boss. Yeah, man. Ronnie, what's good, bro? What's good, man? Yeah, so I'm just going to talk about uh, um, a couple of matchups and things are really cool. And then and then what we'll do is is just chop it up about some of the stuff that we saw or some of the things that we may be that may impact the series. Before I do that though, let me bring in the superstar from backstage. You know how the superstars get when they backstage they backstage waiting, you know what I'm saying? You got to treat them superstar status. Yo. Good afternoon. Unk. Salute to the chat. Salute to everybody. Hope you guys have a good afternoon. Yeah, man. Salute, salute, bro. Um, so in terms of, of matchups, if we just get right to it in terms of, of matchups and stuff, mm -hmm. there are there's this obvious one, the one that's on the screen. Right? But the one the one I wanna um um do just real quick. I think that's Jake backstage. Hey, hey, Jake, how you doing, man? 
What's going on, hey, Jake, Jake. Hey, so we got a so we got a show planned already. You you welcome to, to to be a part in all that stuff, but we already had some stuff planned. So so we're oh. not gonna be so we're not gonna be doing around the horn and all that stuff. We're just gonna get straight to the nitty gritty. So you're oh, gonna have to be fault. patient with us. Okay. Yeah, no you're, problem. You're gonna have to, so you're gonna have to be patient with, with me and Cowboy Bob a little bit as we break the stuff down, and then we're gonna get into a general conversation afterwards. I'll use my ears. I'm all listening. Yeah, gotcha. or, or, right. No doubt, no doubt. I, I I just had to explain that just so so that you'll know, you know, it's not a, a ill vibe. It's just we already had something planned. No doubt. So 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 in terms of of in terms of of the matchups, there is a um, there are a few or a couple significant matchups, right? And then there are fringe matchups. But for the sake of conversation, we're not gonna um um you know do a um um a battle royal on the peripheral matchups not today we'll talk about the major matchups and then we'll save the 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 fringe conversations for later like like nobody wants to talk about um Nicholas Batum versus Josh Hart at, at least not not yet right but the 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 key matchup in my opinion is is the Sixers backcourt versus the Knicks backcourt. Primarily, primarily Tyrese Maxey versus Jalen Brunson. And I know they won't they won't guard each other. They won't guard each other for, for the most part. Right? But the explosive 6'2 Maxey versus the crafty Jalen Brunson may be one of the matchups that define the series. What do you think about that, Cowboy Bob? I agree. I think that Maxi, after last night's game, seeing how he had to change it up, him attacking the rim, him and Brunson has similarities, but Brunson's better with the three ball. I think that's going to be a very good battle. Okay. It's a battle basically which, like, is Maxi going to come out and start off hot like he didn't do that last night, but we all know how Brunson is. So I think that it's just a battle of the guards right there. Okay. Okay. And I, I definitely think we should be aware of Tyrese Maxey catching fire. Yep. I think that's I think that's significant. Yeah, right. And he has the ability just like Brunson to get to the right. He can pull up get fouls and go to the three-point line and hit his three points off of a pick and roll with Embiid. And he's very good at what he's doing when he attacks. So I think that him and Brunson going back and forth is going to be what's basically normal for this matchup. Right. Right. So I, Yeah, I think I think Tyrese Maxey, if, if Tyrese Maxey is a 24-point per game and under type of player in this series, I think he's a non-factor. Yep. Because this Where, season he, he has a waffle. I was going to say him having multiple 30-point games. You're right. He's averaged, I think, 30 or 40, 31 games this season, 30-plus, and they were winning based off of that. And he gets everyone involved, similar to Brunson. Right, right. And on, on the other hand, I think if the Sixers hold Brunson – under 30 for the series and and on bad efficiency i think the knicks may struggle to score which which in this series i can't see i'm predicting most of the games to be 90 something to 80 something that that's where, where i'm with it i'm thinking like most games are going to be 94 86 97 89 and in that area, I can't see uh, up and down the floor track meet for multiple reasons, and and we'll get to those reasons um, after after as we progress. But I think the 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 defense in the backcourt of Dante Divincenzo is is an underrated element that I think is going to be a major element um, as as the season as the series progresses. I'm sorry, I keep saying season. I'm talking about um, at the series. If if Dante can hold that man somewhere between, and, and I mean Dante's defense, Deuce's defense, everybody else that plays guard, if we can keep them in the neighborhood, if we can keep Maxi in the neighborhood of somewhere 
of 17 to 27 points, I think it's a, a easy, serious victory for, for the Knicks. Woodshed1914 is in the building. Absolutely. I agree. On the other hand, on the other hand, we got annoying lottery. I, I, on the other hand, I don't see a defender in Philly's backcourt that could stop Jalen Brunson without specifically one on one, but definitely when they go to that that trick zone mm-hmm. that they like to run, they go to a trick zone with short guards. So it'll be they'll go to a trick zone with Maxi and. Um, Cal Lowry and Cameron Payne. Maybe maybe even Buddy Healed. Right? Maybe even, even Buddy Healed, but but I don't know if their defense their backcourt defense is one that could slow down Dante DiVincenzo or Jalen Brunson. So what do you what do you think about that? I uh, the only person I think that really can slow down either one is uh Kelly Obert. And I say because of his height and his length. He doesn't jump at head fakes. He stays in front of his man. And don't get me wrong, he has just enough to piss you off to where you can get frustrated when he hits you. But for me, I think Kelly on Brunson is probably their best choice. But then you got Dante to worry about. So either way you look at it. And what type, is, and what type of defense? I'm sorry? Kelly Oubre versus Brunson and what type of defense? Honestly, we're going to have to do a for the sixes. Basically, what they saw against last night against Miami, the 3 2 zone, to where they had the man that was floating around at the top or a 2 2 1 zone, to where you have the one person being the floater, basically an extra small forward or a guard. Right. Um, what you would do is, is you would then collapse. Like, if he's being guarded up front by Larry, when he gets to the basket, you have Kelly come in on the sneak side and then they trap him. That could work because when Brunson pulls up, Kelly can actually put his hand in his face and actually get that block. I'm not going to say it's going to be that much a deterrent, but the fact that he can contest it and get to that spot just as good as Brunson can rattle us a little bit. But outside of that, they have no real defense because Kyle Lowry, I don't think he can keep up with Dante, and I don't think he can keep up with Brunson unless he's coming over as a rotating help. Right, right. What, what I'm going to, what I'll say to that is, is if they do that. If that's their their um, model for defense, what I'm going to say is that Kelly Oubre will – I mean, not Kelly Oubre. OG and Anobi will be dunking at the rim all series. As long as they're in that defense, right, some type of, of textbook zone or, or junk zone with Kelly Oubre chasing, mm-hmm. Jalen Brunson, I think, will be dunking all night. Even if they go to a boxing one style that Nick Nurse is not above doing. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's above doing that. I think he, I think you can legit, I think you can legit um, understand if the Knicks are just scoring at will at the rim. Because once you, because, you know, once you start doing these exotic zones, taking one man out, putting one man on an island, there are multiple things to, to happen. For one, what happens when Jalen Brunson figures out how to cook Kelly Oubre? Right now, you've now you've sacrificed your defense, and the guy you sacrificed with it is getting cooked. Man. Right. Plus, also, he could still pass. Most people forget when that double team came out, he's been doing a lot quicker with his passes. So, not just OG, like you said, iHeart can get off too. Like, precious, whoever's down low can get off as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Bronx in the building. Andios. Hewlett Samuel is in the building. Justo 11 is in the building. Salute. 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 Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say this. I think the the clear advantage in this matchup. Yeah, I, I think the the clear advantage in this matchup um, in terms of backcourt is the Knicks. And it's not because Tyrese Maxey is not. A great scorer. Right. And it's not that he's not a good defender. Right. Mm-hmm. But in the playoffs, in the playoffs, when you're talking about, you know, carrying the load offensively and defensively, 
It's just too much. It's too much of a thing in order for one player to be carrying the the team offensively and defensively and being so much responsible for so much stuff. I think Tyrese Maxey will will play defense. He won't be he won't be um, um, Deuce McBride type out there. And I think he'll score, but he won't be Steph Curry out there. I agree with that. Hey, Mets, we already got a, a format going. So so just, just chill out with us and, and work with us as we get through this thing. Um, it's not an ill vibe. You know, we're not acting funny or nothing like that. It's just we already had something planned. So we just want to get through it first before we get to the um, open dialogue, okay? Okay. All right. So and so basically what we're doing is is we're we're um doing we're evaluating the um um the game plan for for um Philadelphia on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. We're 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 evaluating um the coaches, the backcourt and and the matchups. And so you, you know, feel free to chime in if you have, but but make sure, but just ensure that that we stay on on the topic, though. You know, a yeah. lot of times we have so much energy that we, you know, but in terms of of the matchup, Mets, in terms of this backcourt matchup, I think the Knicks will win the backcourt matchup because what the Knicks do outside of of Brunson, I think Deuce is an elite defender. I think Dante is a very good defender. I think Deuce can knock down the three. I think um, Dante can knock down the three. And and um, at times they can create, initiate a little bit in, in terms of Philly's backcourt of Lowry, Buddy Heald. Lowry, Maxi, Buddy Heald, Cameron Payne. I don't think you get as much of that. And I don't know if and Cameron, Cameron Payne will even be in the rotation. Yeah, that is a difficult one. I mean, on paper, you'd think that the be- the bigger backcourt would be better when you consider that Billy's got a little more depth on their backcourt with Oubre, Maxi, Payne, Lowry, et cetera. But here's the problem. A good chunk of these players on the Philly backcourt have been in the league almost at maximum around almost 10 years now, when you, 10 or 12 years now, when you, maybe even 13 years when you look at Lowry. We're at we're at minimum. Most of these guys have been around six, seven years. When you look at Max, five to seven years with between Maxi and Ubre. Yeah, I, I, I'm not for sure if Kelly Ubre is a guard. I definitely need to know he's a wing player. No. He may guard guards on offense, but he's not going to uh, initiate or do guard stuff on defense. Oh, I, meant, I, I think I think he's going to be like that in between in between type guy, like a, a wing player. I meant to say heel. Uh, sorry. No, 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 no. Y'all are right because Mets said it. I mean, I'm sorry. Conway Bob mentioned Ubre also because they saw Kelly Ubre in the game that they had all those injuries. They y'all saw Kelly Ubre. Remember the two game series we played them on Sunday and then on Tuesday. Yeah. Kelly Ubre did. Kelly Ubre did a lot of of stuff for them, but they had a lot of injuries at the same time. So, but but in in this series though, I'm I'm thinking that the Knicks have a clear advantage. Um, in the backcourt, and not just because of depth of bodies, but because depth of skill, right? So, Cowboy Bob, what are you thinking about that? And who who do you think has the advantage in the backcourt advantage? Uh, I say we do because of also our three point shooting. We have three guys that can shoot above forty percent: McBride, Brunson, and um, Dante. Excuse me. And the fact that we have that, you saw Philly last night. They were relying on Batum to hit six three pointers. So. As far as guard play, I think we have it as far as shooters and creating our shots. That's the advantage. Because we get to, we attack the paint, we pull up with our shots. I think that we'll get Philly in the foul trouble. We'll slow down the game and then that's where we'll start to start to get a lead. Okay. I think we have the best uh backcourt. Okay. Okay. Mets, you wanted to re- reiterate your point? Oh, Mets dip. Mets left. Just when I was asking him, okay. So, so yeah, man. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you. I think the Buddy Hield element scares me a little bit. Makes me nervous. I think the the Buddy Hield element makes me nervous a, a little bit when it comes to, um, um, historic historic three point shooters 
mm-hmm. give the ultimate green light in a situation where they need those three pointers. Yep. So that so that makes me nervous a little bit. Can we stop Buddy Hield from being once a week Buddy? Right. And I don't then, know. and then can we also can we also um, take advantage of the diminishing skills of, of Cal Lowry? I think we can take advantage of Lowry unless, and if we transition to the coaching matchup. No, no, we're not coaching. No, we're not doing that. Okay. Stay, we stand on, on the right. backcourt matchup. Anyway. Depends on if Lowry is able to assess that they're expecting him to shoot and he switches to a Pat Sonley mentality. We got to be on the swivel for that to happen. Right. If that happens. Right, right. Is there is there a strategy that we can do or use to ensure that does happen? Well, we can't crowd them because that would just leave everyone else open. Right, right, right. Does that does that make you nervous though? Leaving other people, leaving others open, more or less. Okay. What about you, Cowboy Bob? Uh, I think the strategy outside of leaving them open, I think we should stick to the four guard set like what we had, but add OG instead of Josh Hart. Like have McBride on um Lowry, Maxi getting covered by Dante, and then see if if Kelly's gonna be that wing guy coming in as a guard, we don't know, but have OG on him. So then that way we can protect the perimeter and rotate. He's a starter, out. right? Yeah, he's a starter. Yeah. That's why. That's the only reason why. Because if Kelly, I know Kelly's gonna get shut down by OG. But what I'm saying is, that the way that they can rotate and take advantage of cutting to the basket, that's 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 everybody's de- default basically. So for me, if we do what we did with McBride, Dante DiVincenzo, and Brunson, have those three with OG and iHeart, I think that that'll be better because we could spread the floor, keep up with Maxi. If he's cutting, we can rotate. If we have so for me, I think that that's the better matchup for us to prevent them from getting hot. Right. Exactly. Right. 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 I, I would and I would suggest the thing too that the Ubre matchup I think is not um, um, a a boogeyman like we think it is because we also have a six seven six eight athletic wing player that can guard Kelly Ubre on offense. So that's not a that's not an issue for for I don't I can't see that being an issue for us. I do though. I do though. Um, um, see a world where um, Buddy Hield can be a problem, but it's not a. It's not a, a Tyrese Maxey. I mean, it's not a Kyle, uh, Kyle Lowry and Buddy Hield issue. It's a three guard issue when they go to when they go very small. Uh-huh. Like maybe maybe they go Maxey Lowry. Um, healed Ubre and and their big, whatever their big is, whatever big they have on them, because Embiid is not going to play 48 minutes. We all know that, right? But when they go to a smaller lineup, I, I think that may be um, um, a, a spur in our boot, so to speak. But at the same time, I think that plays right into the hand of our second unit, especially Bogey and, and Josh Hart, who will get those some of those. Josh Hart's going to start, but he's going to play a lot of minutes with that second unit team. Also with Deuce, I think with them throwing up bricks, I think we can get rebounds. Um, I think we'll beat them on the boards because we'll stay big. When they take their big off the floor, we'll have a big coming in off the bench. And so we'll be able to beat them up on, on the glass. So we we will welcome their guards throwing up bricks. Y'all got anything to say, about, anything else to say about the backcourt? Um, not really. No, I'm good. I just believe that, to be honest, we just gotta stay focused. Don't don't get our heads down too early. That's pretty much it. Okay. Okay. All right. So here's the the, the matchup that that makes me nervous, bro. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's the the Joel Embiid versus Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson matchup. Um, Joel Embiid is is a great player. Not going to deny that. My my thing is coming into this series, I think Joel Embiid may be about 65 about about 65 
of what we normally see because he's returning from injury, kind of like how we feel about Mitchell Robinson and OG and Anobi, mm -hmm. about how he may have some rust because he's been out for so long. Mm -hmm. But but here's the thing. Here's the thing with that, right? Here's, here's the thing with that. I do believe that Joel Embiid is the best foul baiter in the NBA. Even when his game is not on point, he can get to the free throw line. He's probably one of the best ever at getting to the free throw line. And with and with our guys, we can't afford Mitch and Hartenstein to get into foul trouble because even a 70% Joel Embiid versus Precious Achua or Jericho Sims is not a matchup that we want to see. I agree. I see, yeah. I see a lot of people in the league fall for Embiid's head fakes. He does a lot of like it's a lot of things he can do to get those guys into trouble. Basically, you got to stay in front of him, and it's very hard to with the way he's able to also shoot the three, dribble out, and create his own passes. So, even at seventy percent, y'all are not even understanding. He can still pass. He can still get at least twenty to twenty-five points. Like that's still dangerous, and give you at least eleven rebounds. Yeah. That still affects us because we got to now work with. I hard got to box him out correctly, or we're gonna use Mitchell just for rebounding. Then when we go back on the offensive side, we're like, what are we going to do with Mitchell? So we can't, it's not so much Embiid doing anything outside of him being Embiid. It's actually us. On the defensive end, we got Mitchell. On the offensive end, we got iHeart. How can we balance it out to where they can not fall for the face, not get them to the line? I, I agree with you. Embiid I, is I, think, I think the Mets has it. Mets has the answer for it, right? And, and, and I'm not going to speak for him, but it goes along the lines of, don't fall for it. Yeah, I mean, it's big. Whenever Joel does those head fakes, it reminds me of the old Scooby-Doo dupe trick, you know, where he goes into a disguise and basically fools with the attackers. Right, right. That's right. where I think Joel shines. He's a master of the dupe. Right. He's and, a and, trickster with this. Right, and Mets, to your point, and we have guys that at times can't help themselves but fall for it. Uh -huh. especially Jericho Sims, who we love, by the way. We love Jericho, right? But yeah. Jericho is not what you call a, def um, 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 a um, disciplined a disciplined defender. One up fake, and Jericho Sims is jumping through the roof. And right, so so I, I guess the thing is, knowing Joel Embiid is 70%, the best thing to do is let him catch the ball away from the rim and crowd him and stay down on defense. Make him jump over you in order to get his shots off or make him put the ball on the floor and dribble to the rim on that sore knee. Well, here's the oh. thing with this matchup when you look at I mean, Hardenstein and Mitch, more so with Hardenstein than Mitch, he's going into this series gas because he's had to play starter for about the better part of half of the regular season. Joel, he's coming – that even though he's at 70%, to me, he's coming back. He's coming into this series more or less fresh as a daisy because of how much time he took off because of the knee issues. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but, the, but, the, but when that game occurs, the Knicks will have been off for six days, though. So, I, was gonna, I, I mean, I understand the point about fatigue because fatigue only gets better with it, with extended rest. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, Hartenstein's going to have to to suck it up, man, and be – so I understand Mets' point right there. I, the thing that I would say is crucial, though, is balls. those early in-game fouls. Joel Embiid is going to foul bait early to get out of the game plan that we had set. And and so whether it's Mitch or Hartenstein, we have to stay disciplined on Joel Embiid. Let him catch it at 18 feet. And if he wants to hoist 18, 20-footers, on on a on a bad knee, by all means, let that man do it. We'll live and die with with twenty footers, right? Because if he's shooting twenty feet, if he's shooting jumpers from twenty feet, that means our rebounders have the advantage at the rim, and their best rebounder is shooting jump shots. I was going to say that too. The three ball. If he yeah. starts in, if we see him pulling threes and he's in one or two early, that's that that's another rock in our shoe or spur, like you said. Right. Now, when it comes to big man depth, of course, we have the advantage because we have Hartenstein, Mitch, Precious, um, 
um, Sims. So we'll have we'll have the big man advantage. But the, but the key to it is but the key to it is is this: making sure we don't get into our depth. We don't want to get into our depth by fouling Embiid early, then giving him free throws, getting him started early, and racking up um, foul calls against us early. That that might be a recipe for disaster, but it's something that we have to look at. Um um, on on the offensive side for our bigs, what do you what do you think our our bigs can contribute to offense? Gang up the sticks, gang in close for the rebounds if they can get around and beat, and if need be, for Hartenstein throwing up that little baby floater and then throwing it down, and for Mitch just getting the ball and if he's not such a coward, throw it down. I, w- I was going to say the same thing with uh, iHeart. I want iHeart in the foul line, pretty much posting up, trying to kick out passes or creating and facilitating with the skyhook. But if we're going to use Mitch, Mitch box out, offensive rebound, putbacks, just dunk. Keep being physical with MB, keep pushing him out of the way because if you do that, if you're giving him physical and then he's being drawn out, it's going to wear him down eventually. So that type of mix awesome. and match. Also, Mitch up the foul line. Yes. No, no, no. I want, I want Mitch at the foul line because if Mitch is drawing fouls against Embiid, that's good. Because look at what happened last night with it, with Bam. Two quick fouls, and B got to go sit. So that's what we kind of want. I mean, offensively, we know Mitch is very wishy-washy when he's at the charity stripe. Right. That's why right. I want him sure. off the charity stripe at any and all costs. I, yeah, I, I, I'll take I'll take him at the strike because it's going to give him be two or three fouls, and then he's going to sit. Then we can go ahead and control the offense in a different way and play our game. The object is to get Embiid off the court, not keep him on the court. Or when he's on the court, get Joel Embiid out running. Like like yeah. I, I think so. Offense has different layers to it. I think if we consider our transition offense, getting out and running a fast break off of a miss by Philadelphia. I mm-hmm. think by getting Joel Embiid running unnecessarily on that on that leg that's healing, I think that's mm-hmm. a benefit for us. Right? And like slow to slow it down. Like we run down court, and in the second we get a play, let him come up and set up with the defense, and then just start moving. No, quickly. no, that's not that's, that's, that's what you mean. Or you mean not, just let me straight? Let me finish. Let me finish my point on it before, before you jump in real quick. I think I think the the transition part of it, right? Getting out, running the floor, getting a lead. Right, getting up by eight to twelve points forces even more and more pressure on Joel Embiid, where every basket counts for Joel Embiid. Like every basket will be important, every make or every miss, every free throw is is important, right? So, so it's it's one of those when you get a a three hundred pound man running up and down the floor, just not coming off of injury, trying to get back into the game. I think that plays to his detriment, and 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 maybe to a point where he may not he may have came back not at a hundred percent but it may be a detriment to him and then plus when you get out in transition their their weak side shot blocker and rim protectors in transition are guys like Kelly Oubre and Tobias Harris not Joel Embiid okay. so while Joel Embiid is a tree in the paint on defense against us when we get out and run in transition that 300 pound man has to run from rim to rim to, in order to protect his, uh, in order to protect his, uh, to protect his rim. Oh, okay. I like that idea. Mets, what do you think about transition offense? I think it's vital for this game. I'm not sure yeah. who's got the advantage. I would say us on paper, but execution is a different breed of cat. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Josh Hart grabbing rebounds, pushing the pace, getting out in transition, doing like Cowboy Bob likes to say, be a bowling pin, go one against three. Yeah, yes. you know what I mean. But but the key to that is securing the rebound, though. Securing the rebound on our end, getting out and running, and I think Philly is going to want to do that too. Hmm. I agree with that. And Virtu- Virtue also says, is Mo Bamba going to be more involved um, for the Sixers? I don't know. 
I don't know. Last night he didn't play. Last night he didn't play, and then in critical Sixers minutes, I saw Paul Reed. I didn't see Mobamba. Yeah, I, I'm. I know he played this year because he played against us. But but at the same time, at the same time, I don't think. Uh, um, I don't. Is is Mo Bamba a um? Is Mo Bamba a playoff rotation player? Not in my opinion. No. I, I I don't I don't know. Maybe if Embiid gets hurt or or in foul trouble, then maybe maybe he's going to be added. But I, I mean, I don't know to be honest. Yeah, I don't know neither. Because to be honest, it's just I only see Embiid. <laughs> and when they do switch out, they put like they run their small. Yeah. 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 Um, um so that's the offense in terms of the 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 front the um the big man met the Joel and Bead matchup. That's the offensive part. Mm-hmm. Defensively, how do we solve a um, the Joel Embiid um, conundrum. Joel Embiid is one of the best defenders at the rim in the NBA. We ch- I checked it a couple of times from the last the, from the last few things that I saw. Joel Embiid is is a great defender at the rim. Is there a way that we can neutralize that? Honestly, I don't. I mean, it depends on if we who we're using. If we're using Josh Hart or Dante to attack the rim. We would have to go up and under, do more backdoor cuts, have him have him present, but use the rim pretty much to block him off. I say we still attack the rim whether he's there or not because it still wears him down and it's still going to get him physical. And then when he's worried about the shot, we still have the help with the back end of the rebound. So if Brunson's pulling up, let's say, 12 feet from the rim and then Beats coming out to contest the contested stop, the shot, we can still box out and get those rebounds. Right. That's the intent. Try to draw him out range. like mid range. Yeah, no, nah, not the three. More like the mid range. So that way he's out of the he's out of the zone and out of the paint, but he has to come back in quickly to try to grab a rebound. Okay, Mets. What are you thinking about that? I'm in the same boat. We need to do those picking, do a run, a quick pick, pop, cut shots, and cut and runs, and so forth. If we're gonna try to outmaneuver on MB. We can't power through him. We got to out. We got to go through him. We got to go around him. We got to use speed. Right. I'm going to say I'm going to say um, something to that also in the fact I think we probably need to get that big man moving his feet more. Right. Get, getting him moving his feet. Getting him out of certain spaces that he's comfortable with. And more into spaces where he has to um, go out of his area more, and not preserve um, offensive energy on defense. Don't make the game easy for him. And and how we do that, ironically, ironically, is by letting Jalen Brunson cook in the paint, right? And if they stop that, then Hartenstein's um, superstar floater, the baby, the baby floater from the top of the key. And and if Philly commits to stopping Hartenstein, which they probably won't, but if they do, then what Cowboy Bob said about you know us cutting back door if Embiid is away from the rim, so that we can get OG or Dante or Josh Hart dunks at the rim. Mm-hmm. True. It's the it's the it's the adage um, when the cat's away, the mice will play. In 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 that vein. So. I agree with that. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So how do y'all feel about the OG and Anobi versus their wing player matchup? Hmm. It's going to be a tough one. I mean, it depends on who's on the wing. It could be Batum. It could be Ubre. Whichever one it could be, OG's going to have a rough, it could have a rough night. Batum especially but it depends on which Batum we get. Do we get the BS Batum who can't hit for a shot to save his life, like we saw a bit freezing when he was in Charlotte or the back end of his Hornets tenure? Or is he the elite sniper for Batum that we saw in the early portions of his career in Portland? That's the key on that one. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, honestly, 
anybody that OG commits to is going to be a great detriment to them because that's taken away from their offensive player. And whether it's Kelly, Batoon, or whoever, I think that OG is going to do enough damage to where the way I've been seeing him able to reach cutoff cutting lanes and creating his own offense, those little knick-knack little cuts in and breaking up the passes, he can get us whoever he's doing, two or three steals to start our offense. So I'm not so much worried about who he's defending. I would be worried about whether they're making their shots or not. Because if Kelly comes out and he's hitting these shots from, like, the logo, then OG can't stop that. But I have enough confidence that he can slow slow down 76ers and give us two, three points in transition off of turnovers. Because last night, they gave, like, eight turnovers by that first half. Right. And the way OG's reading the lanes and cutting and contesting and blocking – and Josh Hart coming over too and trying to sneak in in the back. Yeah, we can take advantage of that. Right. Yeah. I, I I'm gonna I'm with Kerry Cox on this one. Kerry Cox stole my thought as usual. Um, um, OG is better than anybody Philadelphia has on the wing. And don't mean even even if Nicholas Batum decides to go off and he won't. I think that's I think that's you know one in a million. Right, I don't think Nick Batum is a guy that you should even be game plan for, to be honest. But even if he does, even if he does seem to ignite some 2010 Nicholas Batum or 2012 Nicholas Batum, I think that's still not enough to to sway a playoff game. Right, I, I, my thing is defensively, OG and Anobi is shutting down all of that. That's yeah. what he's expected to do. That's why he's here. Right. Uh, offensively, offensively, um, Nicholas Batum at 215 pounds or Kelly Oubre at 210 pounds versus OG and Anobi, who's the better athlete, by the way. OG and Anobi is 240 pounds. Right. I don't see a world where where Batum or Oubre can stop. OG and Anobi from what he wants to do offensively. I, I don't, I don't, I, I think that the better defensive matchup for them would be to put Tobi- Tobias Harris on OG and Anobi. But if that happens, then now you have Joel Embiid in the rim at the rim by himself mm-hmm. to do those aforementioned things that Cowboy Bob said earlier, which was a good point. I think Mets jumped in on that too. Or the, those those things that the guys mentioned earlier about how to best take care of Embiid, and I know we moved on to the wing conversation, but I'm just j- just drawing a parallel on how these two things connect. Whereas if Tobias Harris has to guard OG away from the rim, now you have Embiid at the rim by himself, mm-hmm. right? And if you can't make and if you draw Embiid away from the rim, and you can't make a layup over Kyle Lowry. Then you just can't make layups. I'm sorry. Yeah. I yeah. honestly, I was gonna say I honestly think that that's the best way because, and I do agree with the pressure point point because that's what I actually have in my notes. I was like, our bench needs to get involved. Like, precious, you need to be the way that you were those five games we saw you in. You need to be that guy. You got to be aggressive in the paint, box out, and control. Because if OG is shutting down the wing, we're going to need you to shut down the other side with the rebounding as well. Because Embiid is still going to be on the court. So as long as OG is there, because I see OG on the wing and then pressure's down low, we got to control that. Because if Embiid is cutting to the rim, getting rebounds or pushing people so out you said of the way. So what about Josh Hart? You think pressure is going to start over Josh Hart? The first game, yes, because Josh Hart nah, can he ain't, starting over, he ain't starting over no Josh Hart, bro. Stop it. Okay. I, I was just saying because of the size. You got to relax, bro. I know you're excited, bro, but, but, but your presence is not starting over no Josh. Tip ain't going to do that. True, true, true. You, you, think Tom Tib- <laughs> you think Tom Thibodeau is going to make a wholesale change in the playoffs? Nah, nah man. Really- it, it sounded I mean, good when I thought it. Do it. It sounded good when I thought of it, but when it came out of my mouth, I was like, nope, put it back in, but it was too late. But, yeah, I think that coming off the bench, I think Precious need to learn that. But Hart will start. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And and for that reason, everybody, for that reason, I didn't get into the the OG and Anobi guarding Tyrese Maxey thing, because if you put if you put OG and Anobi 
on Tyrese Maxey, your weak side shot blocker is going to be Dante DiVincenzo or Josh Hart. I think we got to. I think we got to relax. We got to relax a little bit on on the on the the whole. <laughs> Yo, mm -hmm. we got to relax on the whole OG and Anobi is gonna guard everybody type thing in in game in game right. I I think they'll start off with Dante on Maxi to see if how he gets going, and then but we have Plan B and C on how to make adjustments on on Maxi because even if Maxi is going off and we're mm -hmm. still win and we'll still we're we are still winning. Do you need to slow down Tyrese Maxey? No. If, if, for instance, if if Tyrese Maxey is going off for forty, but the Knicks are up seventeen, do you do you really need to adjust your defense? No, no. Let that let that man do his one man gang, his one man show, and they'll lose by twenty five. But but Tyrese Maxey will have fifty, mm -hmm. right? Unless, you want, you want to, yeah, you want to win the score. You don't want to win the the box score. You don't want to win the, the the matchups and such. Unless of course we end up with a situation where we nearly let slip away, way like we did against Boston last Thursday. Right, right, right. So I have one more thing before before we break it open and do, um, before we break it open and have the the general conversation, right? So. The coaching matchup. So, so Mets, you can go first on on this one since okay. Cowboy Bob went first on the others. Okay. Um, um, describe who is going to win the coaching matchup and why. This is dependent on the on in my view on psychological health. Nick Nurse, he's a relatively young guy, which means he's still like a ball of clay, adaptable, able to see what could happen. And, and then change it up to where where things could flow in his direction. Tibbs, on the other hand, you already know my opinion, and that and saying that again is being a dead horse. He's inflexible and borderline unadaptable, stubborn to a fault, and that could be his biggest downfall in this series. If he's not ready for any new wrinkles Nurse can throw at him, the Knicks are going to be sunk. As much as I hate to say it, I'm giving the edge to Nurse. Okay. Okay. What do you think, Cowboy Bob? The only real kind of truth to think that Nick Nurse or Tibbs is better, that's all personal preference to me. But what I'm going to say is I think Nurse actually has the proper adjustments at the right time. Last night when they were down, you saw him make the right adjustments in the fourth quarter to where Miami couldn't come back even though they had injuries to deal with. But still, I see that is the difference between Tibbs and him. Tibbs will believe in his guys as long as they're hitting their shots, as long as they're doing everything, we're good. But when it comes to that tough point, when you got to call a timeout and make the adjustments, I think that Nurse can get his team on a two-minute run, two run to stop us. I think it's fair because of the way the players are and the way the Knicks – I think it's equal because the Knicks players already know enough about Tibbs to where they don't need that much coaching. Okay. All right. So in terms of of in terms of preparation, I'm going to give the advantage to Tom Thibodeau. Right? The, the, no no coach prepares more or more thorough than than Tom Thibodeau. We 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 know that. Yes. Um um in terms of defensive scheme, I'm going to give the edge to Tom Thibodeau. Right. I, I, I think that the defense with OG and Anobi and with Tom Thibodeau and with Hartenstein and with Deuce and with Brunson, with OG, with Precious is is like making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's like the best of both worlds, two sides coming together to make something perfect. Right. It's like a Reese cup, chocolate and peanut butter, put two things we like, put them together and it becomes something perfect um, in terms of of offense. Um, I think it may be a tie because Nick Nurse is not going to overcoach Joel Embiid and right. he's not going to overcoach Tyrese Maxey because there's no need. And I think Tom Thibodeau is going to do the same thing with Jalen Brunson, right? Not overcoach, not complicate. But when the um, opposing defense throws something at Jalen Brunson, I think the entire coaching staff 
will come together to figure out what Philly is trying to do to Brunson. And then that way, either formulate an answer to that, solve that defense, or do something to prevent them to from going into that defense. And right. And and so mean? and so hold on, hold on, hold on. My thing also with, with the coaching is in late game situations, regardless how great you are as a coach, I think Tom Thibodeau has the advantage because the Knicks are a deeper team and, and they have more options later in games where you can legit, you can legit um, um, either go big or go small. You can add deuce, you know, you can take, you can add bogey for offense if you want. And I don't think Philadelphia has those options allotted to them because their roster is not ideal. So, so in terms of, of the coaching, I'm going to give the, the nod to Tibbs right now. I think Tibbs right now is the better coach and has more equipment and things, uh, has more um, things at his disposal to win any type matchup. And that's for this series. Now, of course, when we advance into another series, we'll reevaluate, right? But in this series, I think Nick Nurse has less to work with. And so that might be one of the things that goes into his his decision making. So basically, from what I understand, it's me giving the edge to Nurse, Breezy giving the edge to Tibbs, and Bob is somewhere in the middle. Yep. Okay. Because I, like I said, I agree with both y'all points, but. I don't know. I just I gotta see game one to be honest before I can make a a full assessment. I think both coaches are good. All right. So okay. All right. But trust me, if it was Doc still yeah. coaching Philly, I would have given this all the Ted's. Right. <laughs> right. And and so here here's the thing. Here's the thing too. Just um, just really quick. I guess we can talk, speak about this, and so so that Nick fans can get an understanding of of outlying factors. How important is the environment of Madison Square Garden in games one and two to this to, to this team? Cowboy Bob, you can go first. Very important. I'm sorry. We any play, I think it was playoff game four last year or any playoff game you see, we need the crowd to be involved. Cleveland. Yeah. Like when we were involved, it was loud, it was ruckus, like we need to be that because they feed off of it. Wait, who do you think Brunson is waving to in the crowd? Who do you think Josh Hart is flexing for? They're doing this all for us. We got to support them by being loud, being on the court, yelling MVP, doing all of that because that's who we are. We got to support them. The crowd is a big factor. We are the sixth man, as a matter of fact. Get out. Okay. Get okay. I, Chat, Chat, what do y'all think? I agree that we are the sixth man. Or seventh man for those who have to watch it on television. Right. <laughs> right. I like that. Right. Yeah. I, I I honestly think the combination of the a well rested Knicks team, right? See, we hadn't played since last Sunday night, Afternoon. right? And so and so we won't play again until Saturday. So I think the combination of of the Knicks being rested, um, um, Tom Thibodeau having time to plan and then plan and then plan again right madison square garden i think it is is going to be a major factor True. um the knicks being the the two seed i think there is going to be in my opinion overall for the series in my opinion i think it's the perfect storm of of everything that's going to help the knicks win game one right in terms of the series we have plenty of time to predict the series Unless you guys want to do your predictions now. Mm, I'm going to say New York in six. I, I can't say, but I think six is the right number. I just don't know what side we are because I have to see game one. I have to see what Nurse brings to the table, and I have to see what Tibbs bring to the table and how they adjust. Are you, saying, already, are you saying the Sixers going to win in six? No, no. I said I don't know yet because the thing is, is what knocks me is – how, well, your, how, do, your, do your prediction on who wins the series and then oh, predict okay. the number. Okay, so then I think it'll be the Knicks in, in six. That's what I was saying. I don't know if it'd be six or seven games for the Knicks. I think we're still going to win. 
I just want to make sure before I say seven games, I think it's six for me to be most comfortable. Knicks in six. Um, so my prediction is is the Knicks in four, and the Knicks will be resting. I think the Knicks legit will be resting, waiting on their second round opponent by next weekend. Speaking of which, who would you be more terrified of if we get to the second round? Indiana or Milwaukee? Um, I'm not I'm not for sure yet. Let's finish this segment and then we'll get to that in the in the open in the open discussion part. All right. Right. Here here's a here's a thing though. Here's a, here's a thing. So you know that Okay. So you know that 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 role players usually thrive in the playoffs mm-hmm. at home, but maybe struggle on the road a little bit. Right, mm-hmm. do you anticipate our role players struggling in games three and four? Mm, no, I, I, I don't. I just think that I see game four like our back. I, I don't see us closing out game four like the way we would in game three. I think we would play the first three games well to where we get the lead, but then that fourth game is going to be in question because they're going to be throwing a kitchen sink at us. Right, right. I think the difference is um, that our our bench, our role players, are veterans, and so and so in previous years when our role players were young guys, mm-hmm. I think you probably saw an element of that. But I think now that we have a veteran laden team, I don't think you'll see the swing as much. I think I think you'll probably see us our our role players probably not excel like they do at home, but mm-hmm. not not disappear like young guys do in the playoffs. I see like Bog stepping up, being consistent, Spurs playing defense, him actually using the bench. Man, I can see that with the role players. Right. 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 But like I said, I don't, I, I don't know. It, for us, I, I don't remember the last time we got a clean sweep in the playoffs. I, I don't remember. Like, a lot of times I've just been frustrated. So, for me, you seeing the sweep, hats off to you. I hope you get it. Right, right. I see the first two games, like, no doubt. First two games you got. That third game, I see us winning because we're rolling high. But that fourth, I don't know. But I hope we do get the sweep because it would be better for us to keep the home court advantage and keep it moving through the playoffs. Okay. Okay. Knock them out early. Get them because if you allow and be like that time to come back, yeah, he could be good in the series. But then, you know, then they could come back. Think about it. How many times have we seen a team being down three two or three one and come back? We don't want that. Right. Right. I would say. I would say this. Um. To say this also. I think the the Sixers role players we have to watch them also because they have veteran role players also, and mm-hmm. and so and and so like y'all were, were wanting to mention before we kind of when we were in the the segments and all that stuff. Now now that the 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 thing is the the kind of the conversation is open so that we can have the open discussion part of it. Mm-hmm. I think some of the things that y'all were mentioning in in the earlier segments like watch out for their role players. And individual players, I think y'all mentioned Nicholas Batum. Like which mm-hmm. Batum are you going? Which Batum are you going to get? I think the I think the in Philly, I think you can expect that. Which Batum are you going to get? Right. Which Which Ubre are you going to get? Ubre is a role player, right? Mm-hmm. Ubre is not an all star. He's not a whatever, whatever. Same he's just a, he's just the guy. Mo Bamba. They're yeah, just, yeah, those just, type guys, Cameron Payne. Yeah, those type guys. They're just there. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget though, they could draw fouls. I, like I hate how Philly plays because it's similar to the physicality. Like we play physical, they do a little bit too. But the way they get away with reaches, the way that they get away with a lot of the calls, is like if we're in Philly, I could just hear an uproar. True. That's why I said, like, the third game, we could just come in, step on their throat. But that fourth, I could just see beep, beep, because the role players that they have, I think all of them feed off of, even though Embiid may not be in the center, they feed, they still run plays as if he's there. So if they're playing like that, it's going to it's gonna wear us down eventually. 
That's true. Okay. Like Kelly slapping. Because I know Kelly, I, I'm not saying Kelly's a great defender, but I've seen him plenty of times get to the lane and slap someone hard on the head. And then they don't even get the foul call. And then you see them like they have to take a couple of minutes to get readjusted. We can't take, we can't have that. We got to be hardcore ready for that too. Right. Agreed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, you heard it. You heard the breakdown. You heard the analysis, the coaches, the players, the schemes. We even had the segment of talking about the role players and everything. Um, um, that'll be it for this show. We'll probably rock tonight at some point. I'm not for sure what time, um, um, but please have your alerts turned on, your notifications turned on, so that anytime we go live, you guys can check us out and we can get your feedback. Put a few of you guys on the screen, like Tay out there. Tay, so, hey, what's good? Everything Nick's. We could put everything Nick's on the screen and, and all of that stuff. Um, thank you all again for coming through, rocking with us in the afternoon. Um, thank you to the panelists, man. We out of here, y'all. Peace. Go New York.